for me, the, the star composer was certainly Stravinsky. I learned later that, that Schoenberg had equal um, magnitude and drawing power, but not that the audience uh, understood that as well as, as they did for Stravinsky. And then I found out later Ives was right in there with them. But I was going to Columbia. Um, my degree was coming along, but I was a little static for about a year there. And Milton Babbitt, the great composer down at Princeton, asked me if I would want to come to Princeton and, and stop playing my flute, stop conducting the university orchestra, stop freelancing with my band and drop my saxophone. And he said, come on in, in here and become a full-time student again for two years. We will train you. You have a great mind and a great ear, but you're lacking a kind of training of what I'm going to non-negatively call academic discipline. And you need that. And then I promise you I'll find you a great job. So that was hard to resist, particularly when he dropped that Stravinsky was coming to the campus for the world premiere of his variations and his, um, his other piece, The Requiem, Canticles. So I went, and they were disappointed at Columbia. I was a little disappointed too, but I, Babbitt was, was fantastic, and the Princeton faculty was fantastic. And we were, instead of a large class of students, all with their hands in many different things around New York City, we were in a small class of students who studied intensely with master teachers. Um, Roger Sessions had been their musicologist, Lou Lockwood, Arthur Mendel, and Babbitt, and Ed Cohn, and Earl Kim were the main composition teachers. And that, that was irresistible. Plus, they gave me a full scholarship and an awful lot of living expenses. And then Babbitt, wouldn't you know, when I got a job, what job did he get me? This job. So uh, I went, although I'm telling you more than I should, I went there partly because of Stravinsky coming. So he came. And uh, Milton knew that I knew his scores intimately. And he said, we're going to want you to, uh, to be involved in some of the rehearsal. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I've got a secret. I'm going to be playing. I had gotten a contract from Harvey Phillips in New York, who was the contractor. And they knew that I was a pretty active freelance flute player. And so I figured I would play. And uh, when it came down to it, lo and behold, that there was a week of oral exams and written exams for my master's degree that were the same week as all the rehearsals and my teachers would not let me play. So I, I got awfully annoyed, to tell you the honest truth. I got even very angry, and I started calling people a lot of bad names. I've never done that before. Cohn just laughed at me. He said, I know you're upset. I would, I would be upset if I were you. But we have something more important that you can probably do. One is, you're one of our strong students. We want you to graduate well. I personally interceded with the president of the university. He will not change the dates you need to understand that you can do something to help the performance by being there as a listener. We're going to count on your ear to find wrong notes. I remember saying, there won't be any wrong notes. This is Stravinsky and Boozy and Hawks. He said, just come and find out. So Cohn came and got me out of an um, exam I was taking. I finished it, and he came and got me. He walked me right into McCarthy Theater. And I didn't know this was going to happen. He walked down the aisle. There were no students. There were no students allowed. And he sat me in a chair behind Stravinsky maybe four feet in front of me, or three feet, five feet, something like that. And I, I didn't dare, I thought I wasn't going to be able to breathe. I mean, it meant a tremendous amount to me. But there I'm looking at this little ant of a man with these, um, this high-domed head in the back, all bald, except for these five beautiful hairs combed all the way around to the back of his head, perfectly groomed, and these gigantic ears that stuck way out and a body that, when the music started, was vibrating all over the place, arms, elbows, moving. And every time there was a downbeat rest on a bar line, you know what he said? One! <laughs> he said one in a loud voice, and he would sometimes chop his hand. I thought I was in a karate class. OK, it was the most amazing thing to see how strong he felt the rhythm. So um, I just sat behind him with my mouth open, taking all of this in for quite a while. But then they started in on the variations for orchestra and the requiem. And my God, were there wrong notes. More wrong ones than right ones, it seemed to me. You know, and they, these are 12-tone pieces, but Stravinsky used that method very harmonically. You knew when a note was wrong, at least I did, and, and I think a lot of other people. And so uh, I started making a list. And in about a half an hour, I had probably 50 wrong notes. The horn ports were not transposed in one section. Uh, they were, they were uh, sounding a fifth too low. Uh, there were sharps missing. Somebody had had the. Um, what do you call it when you, when you dare to do something you should never do? Stravinsky didn't write flats in those years. He wrote only sharps, because he said they were edgier. 
and he said with the 12 tone method, you know, it's A sharp or B flat are supposedly the same, so I'm going to write A sharp. So you're looking at this score with all these sharps all over the place, and some of the, some of the copyists had changed them into flats. You can't do that. You take the score that you were given by Stravinsky. You just don't do that. Ives gave scores to his publishers, and they corrected all his wrong notes. He wrote a fa Ives wrote a famous note to his uh, copyist. Dear Mr. Price, please copy everything exactly the way I have it, and don't change anything. All the wrong notes are right. And so these were wrong notes that were wrong. And I made the list, and there were maybe 50 of them, and, and maybe more than that. I can't even remember now. But it was, ran several pages. And uh, that's not hard for me to do. I was blessed with perfect pitch, but I've also tried to develop my ear every day of my life. And I, I knew right away what needed to be done. So at the intermission, they took um, my list away from me. And, and um, Milton Babbitt himself, I think it was, went up to Robert Kraft, who was doing the conducting, and said, this could help you. And then Kraft said, oh, thank goodness for this. And then at the second half started up, and he announced he took 10 minutes making all the corrections. They wrote them all in. They started to play. And of course, it sounded an awful lot better. So I, was, I felt incredibly humbled. I didn't want to be singled out. as I was just doing, trying to help this wonderful music get born. But I got up to leave at the end of the rehearsal, and I got up to walk away. And I was going down the aisle, and I heard, ahem. I turned to Stravinsky standing up on his cane. And he, he had a big smile on his face and his little mustache, and he was kind of winking at me. He took his cane, pointed it at me, and said, are you the pitch doctor? So that was a highlight of my life, I've got to tell you. I didn't know what to do. I just, I just, I, I, I thought, you don't talk to a god. So what I, what I said to him was, I just liked the right notes. I wanted to hear them right. And he said, well, you certainly helped a lot. Thank you so much. And then later, I said, I, I think it's a wonderful piece. I'm glad I was here. And that's about all I said. I, I heard from Kraft that he often greeted young people to try to disarm them a little bit of their inhibitions, and he enjoyed talking to them. I could have known that, and then I would have maybe spoken with him more, but I didn't. And it seemed to me the only right thing to do was to not try to you know, push myself. But then well, at the world premiere, of course, things went pretty well. And I'll never forget, I was sitting back in the balcony with most of the students were at that time. And um, then the applause came, and Stravinsky couldn't stand up very well. And if he did, he's only five foot four when at his fullest height in his maturity. He was smaller than that at this point. This little guy wrote this unbelievable music. But when it came time to bow, he had this long cane that he could elongate. And he took it and put it on his hat and went up and down like that. And that was Stravinsky bowing. And of course, the audience completely went off and made cheers and bow, you know, wonderful noises about that. And that was the last of that story until a word I got from one of my friends, a bassoonist in New York. He said, why weren't you at the, at, the, um, at the recording session? I said, I wasn't asked. I didn't even know when you were doing it. He said, Stravinsky kept asking where the pitch doctor was. So that's very touching. I wish I'd known him better, and I wish I'd gone to that recording session. And it would have been fun if I could have played. But I saw him. And I saw him, and I, I, you know, it's one of those memories you can never forget. Stravinsky wrote somewhere that he saw Tchaikovsky only a few weeks before he died. Stravinsky was then about nine, and his father, a bass baritone in St. Petersburg Opera, took him to meet Tchaikovsky. And he said, here was this gaunt old man with sad-looking eyes and a long white beard that almost reached down to the floor. But he said, I got to see him. So that's what happened with that. It meant a great deal to me.